Our scripture this morning, uh, I didn't realize this, but it comes exactly from what uh, Rick read this morning in the lighting of the Advent wreath. It's what I read from last night. And I was going over my notes this morning. Last night may have bled into this morning or, or the other way around. So uh, if you're hearing it again this morning, you, you need it. That's what it is, okay? And, and I need it too. Uh, so let's begin in the Gospel of John, the first chapter. I'll be reading the first four verses, and then I will uh, go down to the 14th verse. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word that you have blessed us with. God, we have read it and we have heard it with our physical ears. Lord, take now your Holy Spirit that we might hear it with the spiritual ears that you have blessed us with. Open our hearts. Teach us the message you would give us today. In your name we pray. Amen. I recall the helplessness of our two girls when we brought them home from the hospital. You remember that, don't you? Bringing those children home. You bring the first one home, you think you're going to break it, right? Uh... I mean, they can't do anything for themselves. They can't clothe themselves. Uh, They can't walk. They can't talk. They can't crawl. All those kids do is just lay there and stare and wriggle and cry and make noises. Had to be fed, had to be changed, had to be put to bed, given baths. They're completely dependent upon their parents for their care and security. And it's amazing to think that each of us came into this world in exactly that same way. But that's part of being human, isn't it? That's part of who you and I are, is the fact that we were born as a fragile, helpless creature in the midst of this world. And as we celebrate the birth of Christ, our Lord and Savior this morning, we need to remember that the baby in the manger came into the world the normal way just like us. We need to remember that the Christ child was not only fully God, but fully human as well. We need to understand that the almighty, all-powerful, omnipotent creator of life made himself breakable. The one who sustains and cares for the universe became helpless and dependent upon a teenage girl for nourishment. You know, God became a fetus. The creator of life was created. That's hard to wrap your mind around. It is for me anyway. It's it's difficult to understand. I mean, God had eyebrows and eyes and ears and elbows and, and kidneys. You know, it's hard to believe that our great and mighty God didn't visit the earth in unapproachable light, but instead as a defenseless infant that needed his diaper changed. You know, could... You imagine the angels staring as Mary changed the Lord's diaper? It's difficult to comprehend the fact that creation watched in wonder as the Almighty learned to walk. And as we consider the humanity of Christ, we have to wonder some things, or I do. I wonder, you know, when he was a teenager, did he have pimples? You know, did he have to deal with that? Uh, What was his favorite food, you know? Did he like to swim? Maybe you guys don't think about stuff like that. But he was a human being. And there are a thousand things that we could imagine or wonder why or wonder about the humanity of Christ. But one thing is certain. He was not only completely divine, he was completely human. 
And for 33 years, Jesus would feel everything that you and I have ever felt. He was weak. He grew tired. He was afraid of failure. His feelings got hurt and his head ached. To think of Jesus in this way might seem irreverent to some or uncomfortable. It's not something that we like to do. I mean, it's easier to keep the humanity out of the incarnation. It's easier to clean, shall we say, the manure away from around the manger. It's easier to wipe the sweat out of Jesus' brow and pretend that he never blew his nose or, or hit his thumb with a hammer. Jesus is easier to handle that way. There is something about keeping him divine that keeps him distant and keeps him predictable. But there are those who uh, readily accept the humanity of Christ, but they don't accept the divinity of Christ. They have no problem believing that Jesus was completely human. In fact, some say that's all Jesus was, was a human being, nothing more. He was simply a great teacher and a godly man. Now, these are heresies in the early church that were dealt with in the early, early church. You know, one was Montanism and one was modalism. That shows that I went to seminary, I guess, and remember that history class. But those heresies are alive and well today. The Unitarian Universalist Church, Jesus believes that Jesus was just divine and that a spirit came upon him and that we will go to an ideal place after we die instead of a real place. Kind of a play on words, but it makes a big difference, doesn't it? And then you have our friends that are Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses who believe that Jesus was a human being as well. He was just born into the world like you and I, and, and a spirit from God came upon him and then went back to heaven. Both are heresy. We have to remember that Christ was completely divine and completely, completely uh, human, all wrapped into one. Because if Jesus is nothing more than a godly man, then the rest of the New Testament, you know, pick and choose what you want because it becomes difficult to believe. If Jesus is only a good man, then as C.S. Lewis has pointed out, if he's only a good man, we'd have to say he's also insane. Because only somebody who is insane would say the things about himself and claim the things about himself that he did. So who is this child? What's the identity of the babe born in the manger? John tells us. John 1, 1 through 4 and in verse 14. Listen to that scripture again. Nowhere else in the New Testament is the sonship of Jesus so clearly explained along with his divine nature. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And in verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Now, verse 1 there, we see the eternity of the Word, the eternity of Christ. John writes, in the beginning was the Word. Jesus had no beginning of his own. When other be things began, he already was. He was there. Next, John writes, and the Word was with God. We might say that this shows us the personality of the Word. For the power that fulfills God's purpose in creation is the power of a distinct and personal being. And this being is one who stands in eternal relationship to God through an active fellowship. This is what the phrase, uh, the Word was with God, literally means. Next, John tells us that the Word was God, reveals the deity of of the Word. Though Jesus was distinct in personality from the Father, He wasn't a creature yet at beginning, in the beginning at creation. He is divine in Himself as God the Father is divine in Himself. So within that little verse, that tiny little verse, we are confronted with the mystery of the personal characteristics and distinctions and the unity 
within the Godhead. It's right there. That's theology 101, believe it or not. There is a trinity. Verse 3, through him all things were made. We see the word creating. He was the Father's agent in every act of creation that was ever performed. All that was made was made through him. As Paul writes in Colossians, I think it's 1.16, he not only created all things, but all things hold together in him. Without Jesus, there is no physical life. For he created thing, the, the created, all created things were made in him and through him. You want the Bible's answer to the origins of life? It's right here in the first four verses of the Gospel of John. Life was given and maintained by the Word of God. Next in verse 4, we read that the life was the light of men. The Word of God revealing. For in giving life, He gives us light as well. That's not, that is to say that every person if they admit it or not, receives light or knowledge from God or of God simply from the fact of being alive in God's world. You can read Paul's take on that in Romans 1. For the very fact that they have life is due to the work of the Word of God creating through Jesus Christ. And finally in verse 14, we see that the Word became flesh. Here is the Word incarnate. Here is a statement, uh, the statement that the baby in the manger of Bethlehem was none other than the, than the eternal Word of God. And after John has shown us who and what the Word is, a divine person, the author of all things, he further identifies the Word by telling us that the Word was revealed by the incarnation of God's Son. We have seen His glory the glory of the only one who came from the Father. He further clarifies it in verse 18 when he says, The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father. So it takes John 18 verses to get to his point. You going, well, preacher, you've been going on for about 18 minutes and you need to get to your point. But anyway, this is John's point that he is the Word of God. So when the Bible proclaims Jesus is the Son of God, it's making the assertion of his deity. That Jesus is the divine creator, the divine sustainer, the giver of life, and the light of life. So the Christmas message is really the message of the staggering fact that the child in the manger was God. That's the message. But as we've already talked about this morning, that's only half the story, isn't it? For the baby born at Bethlehem was more than God. He's God made man. The divine son of God became a real human baby. And when he did so, he didn't cease to be God. He was no less God than he was before. He'd simply begun to be human. He had begun to be a man. He was not God minus some of his deity, but God plus all that he had made his own by taking humanity or manhood to himself. And because he had become like one of us, he could now be tempted like us, feel pain like us, suffer like us. Hebrews 2, therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make atonement for the sins of of the people. He had to be made like us to make atonement for our sin. If that's not God in human form dying on that cross, it's a tragic scene, but it is meaningless for the forgiveness of our sins. We see it here in Hebrews 2, chapter 2, that he had to be made like us for the atonement of the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Chapter 4 of Hebrews, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things just as we are, but is yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. 
I need grace to help and mercy every day. So let's approach the throne of grace every day. It's a great comfort, isn't it, to know that the God of glory ascended to our sinful condition and therefore understands our every weakness and our, and our deepest needs. And because he understands those weaknesses and because he understands those needs, he comes to our aid. So God sent his son to us at Christmas. When he did that, he was condescending to our weaknesses. He was reaching down to meet our needs because he is a holy God. And we are a sinful people, so he reaches down to us. Uh, Paul explains this in Philippians 2, 6 through 8. He is speaking of Jesus, who being in very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form and the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death even death on a cross. So when Jesus came to this earth, he stripped himself of every advantage that he had had. He laid his glory aside and he left his father and was separated from him. Now why did he do that? What was the purpose? Well, the only reason that God sent his son into this wicked and cruel and sinful world was to save sinners like you and me. So at Christmas time, we have to remember that Calvary Not Bethlehem is the focus of God's divine revelation that's contained within that baby in the manger. The importance of the birth of Jesus at at Bethlehem lies in the fact that it was all part of a plan that led to the Son of God dying on the cross of Calvary. And if we don't understand this, we take the birth of Christ out of its context. So perhaps the very heart of Christmas, the very heart of the message of Christmas, I think is perhaps found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Not a very familiar Christmas passage, but I think it is the heart of it. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. There we find the meaning of why God became man. For God took on manhood, not as a marvel of nature. He did it as a wonder of grace. That's why he did it. Think about that. The very Son of God, with the eternal riches of heaven surrounding him, he left it all behind to become a poor human being like me and like you. And he did so for us. He did it for our sake, so that we might one day share in the riches of heaven with him. So the Son of God set his glory aside, left behind the riches of heaven, suffered hardship, agony, pain, temptation, and finally death on a cross, so that we might live with him in heaven. That's why he came. And that's why I say that the Christmas story is a wonder of grace. And that's why the Christmas message is a message of hope for ruined and sinful humanity. It's a hope for the pardon of sin, the hope of peace with God, the hope of living with Him in glory. And we have all of this hope because at the Father's will, Jesus Christ became poor and was born in a stable so that 33 years later He might hang on a cross. This is the most wonderful message that the world has ever heard, or ever will hear. And that is the message of Christmas. That God sent his son to this world to redeem a sinful humanity. And this redemption and this love and this grace, that is the true spirit of Christmas. The true spirit of Christmas is the spirit of God that convicts hearts and minds in order to lead people to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Is the Spirit of God, the very Spirit of Christmas, speaking to your heart and your mind this morning? God might be calling you to a saving relationship through His Son. What a good day to be saved on Jesus' birthday. 
wonderful day to find the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your Son. We thank you for the grace that came to us on that first Christmas. Lord, we praise you for all that you do for us. In your name we pray. Amen.